Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. I'm joined today by a man who has hunted on nearly every continent in the world. He is with Korth Group, deals closely with Leupold and Hornady, and he is a prolific, avid hunter and a wealth of knowledge. Welcome to the Silver Core Podcast, Matt Siemens. Thanks for having me here. So we've been trying to line this one up for a little while now. I'm, it's been uh, good to finally make this one happen. Last time we were chatting, man, you were blowing my mind with some of your stories about hunting all over the world, African hunts, your knowledge on ballistics. And I thought there's got to be a way we can distill some of this information, some of your background, some of the adventures that you've had into something where others can learn from your successes and your failures and, and where you're at. So, uh, this is, this is going to be a fun one. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I've been thinking about this for a while. I've always been taught it's always cheaper to learn someone else's mistakes and make them yourself. Right. So if you can get some information from somebody who's firsthand, it's always a good start. I wish I could be like that, but for whatever reason, I've always been the kind of guy who will look at somebody else's mistake. And I got to make it myself and learn from it. Someone will say, Hey, don't touch that stove. It's hot as a child. Right. And I'd be hot. Like how hot? Like, what do you mean by hot? Like, can I touch it really quick and get my hand off? Yeah, I think all, I think that's in the man manual though, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe that is. Yeah, it's just so. ob- obstinate, stubborn, ADHD. Yeah. So you've, uh, you've got a hunt in Africa lined up in a little bit, but I guess what I'd be interested in is your very first African hunt, lessons you learn from it things that went well, things that maybe you would advise other people to do differently? Uh, my first hunt wasn't really planned. Uh, you always dreamt about going to Africa. I never thought I'd ever get there myself, to be honest. It was always something somebody else did. We grew up, um, no extra money, a lot of month left, left at the end of the money, not the other way around. <laughs> Tell me and, about it. Uh, I was living, we were living in Southern Michigan at the time. I was working with Cabela's. So I was in the gun library system. And my boss called me up and said, Hey, do you want to, you think it's safe to go hunt in Zimbabwe? This is when Mugabe was at his seats in the farms and all right. the advisories. I said, Hey, Phil, we live in Detroit. It can't be any worse than here. <laughs> so three weeks later we were in Africa and he had a deal rate arranged. I paid his airfare. He paid my hunt and we went over there and, uh, my only regret is not going sooner. How old were you? Uh, I would have been early thirties. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I look at this and I say, man, you got to have pretty deep pockets if you want to go hunt outside of, even just outside of British Columbia. But I'm certain to learn that might not necessarily be the case. No, there's, it's much more affordable than people think it is. Yeah. The airfare is what's the burden nowadays. Mm. Uh, That's all changed since our pandemic. But um, animal for animal, Africa is pretty cheap. And then people will look at the high-end countries that have, are thousand dollars a day to hunt and think it's all like that. But mm. no, you can go over there. I had a guy from Alder Grove. I sent him over. He did a 15 animal hunt and it was under 5,000 Canadian for a 15 animal 10 day hunt. But that wouldn't include airfare. That either. didn't include airfare, but at that time you could fly for 11,500 bucks. Wow. Um, so. I mean, 15 different animals, $5,000. Yeah. In how long? 10 days. 10 days. So what's it like when you get over there? I've heard, so a friend of mine, he was a PH and he's talks about, it's kind of like being in a lap of luxury. He says he came over and did a hunt with a guide in BC and he shows up and he's like, okay, we're ready to hunt. And they're like, uh, where's your sleeping bags? Where's your kit? Where's your gear? And he's like, what do you mean? Like, don't you guys supply all of this? No. Yeah. It's a different world. Like a lot of people, when I start talking about it and they go, I, my friend went and they had servants and they had maids and they had a swimming pool and they had this and they had that. And I said, that's standard, that that's basic rudimentary there. Everybody has that. Wow. It, it's, it's a different way of life. It's like spa for men. Yes. Yeah. So, so 
walk me through it. You arrive, what's it look like? I was shocked at how big and modern Johannesburg was. I knew it was going to be big, but didn't quite comprehend as big as it was flying in. Mm. Um, the neat thing about there is when you get out of the city, you, you're out of the city, there is nothing. Really? And uh, we flew into from Johannesburg and the first trip we flew into Belo White in Zimbabwe and it was all the Mugabe era and there was nothing. There was all these big, we went to the one version of Costco they have there. I think it was called Farmers, a big discount mm. chain. They had Coke and corn chips in the whole store, two racks. That was it. That was it. That was it. Uh, the first time I was there, there was lineups for about two, three blocks for, f for fuel, uh, fuel wow. stations. The next time it was probably a mile long. And my third trip there, there was simply no fuel. Like you just couldn't get it. They were out. You just don't consider that no. from over here. No, you, like the Africans always have that term, you have to make a plan. And if you can't plan ahead there, you aren't going to go very far. So what do you do? There's no fuel? The PH will have all that sorted. Mm. He has all that. But if you, like, you couldn't do it, do it yourself hunt there. Got it. Got Just it. because of logistics and legality anyways. But, um, yeah, you have to plan for everything. I remember he came across in Botswana with a load of stuff for the trip and they taxed the toilet paper as luxury items. Toilet paper is a luxury item. Yeah. So it, it, it's, oh, man. It, it's third world. Yeah, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So are you using firearms down there? Are you bringing your own over or how does that work? I've done it both ways. Yeah. Um, I always like using my own, mm. but the more you travel with them, the more hassles you have. The trip I'm going on in March, I'm renting. Okay. Just, um, it's just so much easier. What are safety concerns like when you go over there? Is it on the top of your mind? Like I had no, one. No, no. Yeah. I've hunted places where it wasn't on the top of my mind. I couldn't sleep for the first couple of days. Mm -hmm. But um, we're actually flying in Johannesburg this time. Then we're going to drive four and a half, five hours across the country, my boss and myself. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, talk to several people. Four people say it's safe. And the fifth person says, absolutely not. Do not even entertain the thought. And it's all major highways since the last 40 kilometers. I, I feel confident in it. Okay. Otherwise I wouldn't do it. Yeah, had a, uh, a friend, he was over there with his brother uh, and his brother is a uh, U.S. Army. I think it was an A-10 pilot. And um, anyways, they're, they're in Africa. I don't know. Uh, I think they're in South Africa and he was wearing a Casio watch. He's like, you better take that watch off. He's like, what do you mean? He says, your life is worth less than what that Casio watch that you're wearing is, right? Yeah. Is that? There, there's probably sections of the area like that. Mm. And, uh, I plan the route pretty close, like stay on the major highways best we can. Mm -hmm. We have a doctor friend of ours, his family from South Africa. They actually packed up and moved back, uh, two years ago. Packed up, moved back to South Africa. Back to South Africa. From? From Chilliwack. Because? Wow, that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. But he just, like, we've had some pretty candid talks and stuff and, well, their family's from there and stuff, but they just felt there was... Isn't that telling though? That's very telling. Right. And if it was up to me, hmm. when I'm, when we're done this, I get back in my truck and keep on driving to Sea Island, get on a plane and not come back myself. Really? Yeah. I'd be there. Not South Africa. Mm. Wouldn't be my first choice, but I would definitely go to Namibia and not come back. That'd be your first choice? Yeah. Namibia? Namibia would be my first choice. Really? Yeah. So uh, property over there is attainable? Yeah. The, the, there's some regulations of buying agricultural lands and- and stuff, but it's attainable. And I've looked at farms. I've been looking at farms for a couple of years now. And I found like 30,000 acre farms for less than what you can buy a lot in Chilliwack for. Really? Yeah. Well, do you have to worry about squatters or not having property next time you go down there? <laughs> no, not, not in Namibia per se. Okay. It depends where you buy too. Right. But, uh, the, the cheap land is cheap for a reason mm. and the water it's, it might sustain natural game, but livestock and stuff may struggle on it. Like here you talk about how many cows you can have on an acre. Mm -hmm. There it's 40, 50 hectares per, per animal. Like it changes, it, it, it reverses quite dramatically. No kidding. Yeah. How did you get into this line of work? How did you get in? So your, your Cabela's working in the gun, gun counter, gun library? Well, it goes way back. Um, I started working in a local gun shop in Abbotsford in 86, just when I was in high school. Which one was that? Perfection Tackle and Guns. Okay. They're gone since, well, since... 
think 89. But anyway, so I started that and then my goal was law enforcement, went to university and stuff. And then I wanted to move to the U.S. for law enforcement. Mm. So I, um, we're looking to, my, we got married. My wife's born in the U.S. We lived in Prince George. We applied for my immigration. We were told it would take years to come through. Three months it came through. Here, you have to move. Mm. So I just looked for the first job I can. I fired off a resume to Cabela's. They flew me down for interview three days later. And uh, the local law enforcement agencies couldn't compete with what Cabela's paid and benefits. Wow. That was before they went public. Right, right, I started right. working for them when they had two stores. Really? Yeah. Dick and Mary and Jim would come in the store. Huh. Uh, my, my wife started w- work there as well, and she was working the back door once, and Dick and Mary tried coming in without ID. She wouldn't let them in. She didn't recognize them <laughs> when, when we just started. So it, it was, it was uh, they, they looked after employees very well. Nothing like it is today. Yeah, it's a little different now, isn't yeah, it? it? It's, uh, you have shareholders, that changes everything. It, yeah. It's the bottom line is, is what they look at. Well, I guess you still deal with Cabela's now with yes. Corth. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and then from Cabela's, you got on to Corth. Is that, was there a, a transition like that or what? Yeah. Cabela's, um, I was in Idaho at the time with them in Pulse, the Pulse Falls store. It's been there almost 15 years. Mm. They'd gone public. Things were changing drastically. And I was looking for something else. And I said, if something next real job that comes along, I'm going to entertain. And I was doing with a deal with one of the guys from Leupold mm. who worked in the Beaverton plant. I said, hey, if you know I'm looking for somebody, let me know. Two days later, Korth flew me to Alberta for an interview and the rest is history, right? And I like, uh, we're going to have people chime in and I'm sure they said, no, it's not Leupold, it's Leopold. No, that's Leupold. Okay. Yeah. hundred percent. Leupold. hundred percent Leupold. If you call the plant, they're going to answer it, Leupold and Stevens. Leupold and Stevens. Yeah. My very first rifle was a Stevens. Okay. A little takedown, 22 Stevens favorite. Yep. Uh, I could fit it into my backpack. I'd go across the street from my school in a place that I called the desert because they had a bunch of sand there. And, uh, it's Joe Brown Park out in Surrey. They actually had a bit of a range there that the police would use and I'd shoot there. Same as the Delta watershed and same as the Burns Bog out here. I got a sign up. Yeah, I see that there. Over there. Uh, they all had ranges in there and that's, that's where I'd shoot growing up. Yeah. It's a different Stevens though, completely. Different Stevens. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's loophole to Stevens, but nothing to do with the firearm company. Nothing to do with the Chippewa Falls, no. Massachusetts, yeah. Stevens. Got it. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, I probably should know that, shouldn't I? You know, the firearm industry and stuff, you can never say never, right? So mm-hmm. you never know it's, but it's, a lot of people make that assumption. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, hey, I got to talk about my, my first firearm anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing wrong with that one. Yeah. Had a, um. Custom made stock on it for my small frame and a shorter barrel on it. And it came off of a, uh, I think it's some old Cooey that was okay. kind of cut down. And I, I remember even at five years old, trying to hold that thing up. It was the heaviest thing in the world and arched back and that, um, yeah, started shooting at four, first gun at five. That was that one. And, and there you go. But you're, uh, you're pretty heavy into the ballistics as well too. Yeah. I've always found it fascinating. Yeah. I couldn't do math to save my life in high school. But all the you and me both, and even before all the apps came out and ballistic calculators came out, I could sit down and figure stuff out with your basic algebra, and because yep. I had interest in it, and uh, it, it, it's been great. Um, I still am very keen on terminal ballistics, mm. and I should say keen, interested in it. Yeah, you know, you're always searching for that perfect bullet and stuff, and. Is and and, and, and being the Hornady rep, a lot of conversations of people with quote unquote bullet failure. And that's, that's a. Tell me about that. As soon as someone recovers a bullet that doesn't perform the way they want it, to try claiming the bullet failed. Mm. Well, I always, are, where would you get the bullet from? Well, the animal. Well, was it dead? Well, yeah. Well then, okay. How has it failed? <laughs> right. But we, I had an, be careful. I don't want to mention names. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had an account contact me once. They had a bunch of bullet failures with the ELDX in Africa. Okay. Had to shoot a Gems buck nine times. It didn't die and all this stuff. And I said, well, I said, doesn't sound right. Send me pictures. Mm. Well, there were literally, there wasn't a shot in the vitals. It was all gut shot, shot in the, it, it, it was just by North American standards, mm. they may have been in the vitals, mm. but the African tropical games vitals located differently. Really? Yeah. And, uh, quite a, quite enough, like you, like some animals you tuck behind the front, right behind the front leg. Yeah. That's a gut shot. There's nothing there. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll use you like right behind the front leg or yeah. if they're walking, I'll split the yeah. V, go up. A little dramatic, but the giraffe. 
Okay. All the vitals are in front of the front leg. If you if you I tuck it tuck it in behind the, re- the rear shoulder, yeah, you're just going through gut. Interesting. Yeah. So they're gut shooting. They're shooting these things in tails and hooves and yeah, saying I'm, that the bullets I'm, aren't working right. Blaming the bullet. When the ELDF X first came out, I was really keen to try it and had a real good bear hunting spot. We could watch this one bank at 700 yards, 707 it ranged across. Okay. And we were all set up for this. So we loaded a bunch of, we couldn't even get the bullets yet. So I had to buy mm. factory ammo, pull it out and load it into the cartridges we were shooting. And we shot three bears that trip, all total, the th- yardage didn't total hundred yards. So we were all, we we're all equipped to shoot long range and we, everything was <laughs> right in front of us. So. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I like that ELDX. I've used it in uh, uh, 6.5 Creebor with yeah. great success. And then uh, 280 Ackley improved. And, you know, I took a, a moose at a much further distance than I probably should have with the uh, ELDX in hindsight, who was uh, poor ranging and few errors. Everything went as it ought to, went down, but that was uh, almost 800 meters away. And um, uh, it performed performed as it ought to. It, it, it's a, it's a good bullet. Mm. It's, you can't have a bullet soft enough to expand at low velocities and then over expand, not over expand when you're real close and personal at right. extreme velocities. It's softer. So it, ex, it expands at lower velocity. So if it separates up front, if you shoot something at 10 yards, well, it wasn't really designed for that. You're mm. just, you, you just, you're pushing it beyond this limit. It's impact velocity. Mm. Another trend now is fast twist rifles. Right. I'm seeing that. And, uh, you need the fast twist to spin the bullet mm-hmm. to stabilize it, but you can also over sta- over spin it. And now your RPM jumps. You start getting RPM over 300,000 RPM, 320, 350, mm. and the bullets aren't designed for that. They'll burst apart. C- centrifugal fourth will pull them apart. Right. Okay. And it, is it the bullet, did the bullet come apart? Yeah. Well, it just, just didn't work. But then people, people say it doesn't work, but no, it did because you're just beyond its limits. Mm. Like I always say, you can haul bags of manure in your Corvette, but a pickup truck's better. Everything has its purpose, right? Right. There really isn't one be all end all for everything. No, there's a lot of great products out there. Mm -hmm. Some great competitors out there. Yeah. And, uh, but everything has its limits. So the faster twist rate, I've always been of the assumption that if you over twist a bullet as better than under twisting a bullet. Yes. For accuracy. For accuracy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but you start twisting a little too fast, pushing them out a little too hot, too fast. Yeah. You're going to end up having centripetal force, centrifugal yeah. force uh, failure. Well, you start thinking if you, do, if you do the math and there's a formula and it slips in my mind right now, I was remembering on the way in, but now I can't. Mm. Um, like there's some of the stuff, some of the rifle, oh, there's a rifle company out there that's twisted their six, five PRCs. Mm-hmm a whole inch faster than Sammy spec. Okay. And that's pushing it at 320,000 RPM. That's, that's spinning. Yeah. And it's. So why would they do that outside Sammy spec? Just for marketing purposes? Well, I think the general, the general topic is, and I've always said it too, when in doubt, spin it faster. Right. But I, I, with my thinking of that was back when I was building dangerous game gun mm. and you want to be able to get to the vitals from in, any angle. Mm. And if it's too slow, it veers off. So right. when in doubt, it's spinning it faster. But when you're shooting solids, it's a different story than shooting cup and core bullets. Right. Expanding bullets, I should say, because some non-expanding solids will be cup and core as well, just reversed, right? So f- for me, I'm used to primarily hunting with MBC. I've done a little bit in the U.S. Uh, what are some of the biggest differences that I'm going to find for my style of hunting over here for North American game than I would over in Africa. The amount of game you're going to see. Yeah. And, uh, this is going to sound terrible, but spotlighting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I've done it in New Zealand, Australia, yeah. Pakistan, Africa, and it's an, an acceptable way to hunt. It's a different way to hunt. Um, so are you just doing that? To see where the glare comes back off of eyes or you try to freeze them or? It's going out. To, so some animals are more nocturnal. Okay. So I should look for the nocturnal species. Yeah. It's just, a, you should do it one day at one. I bring a group over. We'll do one night, one day and night hunting. Okay. It's just a different experience that you can't do here legally. 
Yeah, well, and, and, and it's hundred percent legal there. You're not you're not shooting your impala and your stuff. You're shooting the night species, mm. gen, like honey badger or stuff like that, and jackal and all that fun stuff. I remember I was in um, an area here in BC, and we're coming back from our hunt for the day. You know, sun's going down. We got uh, one hour after sunset for legal shooting, and as we're heading out. We see a truck going up and people sitting on the back of it and they got their big spotlight and like, hold on a second, what's going on here? Right. And so I get on the report of poacher polluter line and get a hold and just let them know what's going on. And I, and I get a, um, uh, someone come back, got back to me afterwards and says, well, uh, certain people are allowed to do that. Like, what do you mean? Right. And indigenous groups, they say, well, we're, we're not going to touch it. So I researched a little bit further and I guess there was a court case here in British Columbia and there's an indigenous group over on the island and they were successful and they said back in um, ancestral hunting time, we'd go with torches and, and they made their case that way. But it only applies to that one area. And I guess it took a while for conservation officers to kind of get the grounding and know what's allowed and what's permitted and what isn't. Now it's pretty well accepted that, no, you can't do that. And, you know, we work with a lot of different indigenous groups and they're like, yeah, no, we don't do that. You, you can't. This is just a rogue group of people. There's always a few bad apples. Always going to yeah. be that way. And we're, we're dealing with that stuff now in the province with, with, with some of the First Nations are trying to do and they have, they're trying to, they're trying to manage it as a resource. Mm -hmm. And then you have other groups that, from my point of view, are trying to eliminate it because there's no sustainability. Yeah. But that's, that's a, another rabbit hole. Yeah. You know, it's uh, a friend of mine, he was uh, on the podcast before, conservation officer, Ojibwe Bear Clan is his background and the Bear Clan is, they're the protectors of the environment and the people and the, um, very interesting talking to him about that subject and talking to, uh, cause he approaches it both from the indigenous side as well as the conservation officer's side. Man, I learned a lot. Like just the sheer number of different groups that we have here in British Columbia and the number of groups that are going well above and beyond what, uh, non-indigenous folks are doing to help conserve and to protect what's going on there. It was, it was a really encouraging conversation actually. Yeah, like I said, there's some guys out there trying to do the right thing and there's some guys out there with, with no, not looking for the future, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, there's always going to be those bad yeah. apples. Um, you know, speaking of that, part of the reason I thought this would be kind of interesting is because you bring that background and that wealth of experience and you're, you're uh, dealing in an area that most people from North America don't have familiarity with and you know, you look at how the news will portray African hunting and how social media can portray it, but there's a whole other side to that as well. And this is something that, uh, my friend who's a PH was getting into is like, you know, the amount of good that comes out of the African hunting, the amount of conservation efforts and money that's put back into the society and species that are only around because of the hunting. And that's something that, uh, hunters will talk about, but I don't think the, uh, the general populace is, is aware of, of all of those ins and outs. No. And how much of the animal is actually used in Africa mm. would blow people's mind. Really? Yeah. Like I, I'm, it would be funny if BC conservation would enforce the edible meat law to African standards. What's their standards? If it's made of protein and it can rot, you can eat it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We don't, uh, yeah. BC conservation has got a, a yeah. it, and we've got a good standard over here. They have, but a not to the same degree. In Namibia, when you shoot a gems buck, they clean the colon out. Okay. And then they barbecue it till it's crispy. Really? And they think it tastes great. Well, well does I, it? I, have you tried it? Well, it's like eating crispy rubber bands. Okay. But, uh, it's, I'd rather have a Reese's peanut butter cup, right? But it's, <laughs> um, they, they, they swear by it. I mean, I always try everything. Mm -hmm. Just be part of it. But yeah. no, they eat, like they'll clean the paunch out, everything. And if they don't eat it, their dogs eat it. I've seen them take stomach contents in buckets back to the house for fertilizer in the garden. Totally makes sense. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's nothing goes to waste. Yeah. We had a, a butcher on the podcast and he's talking about how he uses every part of the animals through his abattoir and yeah. he's watching how making compost out of it and, and the, the effects that yeah. it's having on, uh, 
the orchards that he's putting in it. I mean, the North Americans got it. We got it pretty, da- pretty down pat with pigs. Mm. You know, the only thing they don't use in the pig, right? Well, what's that? The toenails and the snout? The squeal. The squeal. Okay. Everything, everything else is used, but Africa, everything is treated that way. Absolutely huh. everything. I was shocked. Like shooting hyenas and jackals, they eat that. Okay. Yeah. Some of the, like I've shot cats there and they eat them. Like, like nothing goes to waste. So I had, um, I've had cougar here. Yeah. I've never hunted cougar. Um, last SCI dinner I was at, uh, I think it was Tammy. She was doing the, the cooking out yep. there and cook some up. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. She did. Uh, and you don't think, I don't know, you, I don't think most people would normally think eating cougar would actually be a good meat, but yeah, it was amazing. You know, and, and there's been a big push. Like you see some of the guys now trying to push eating coyotes and stuff. Well, okay, I'll draw a line there, but, um, I'll, I'll try most things, but. Yeah. I, I can't say I'd be too keen on that. And no. I, I don't know if that's because we have a, an emotional connection to our own dogs and you look at that or you look at what these things eat and the amount of bugs that they have in their body. Um. Yeah. It's something, no harm. Anybody wants to try it. Sure. But it's not my cup of tea. I think Renella said that he tried, uh, eating Eaten coyote at one point. Yeah, I've seen one of his uh, sh- shows on it. Okay. And I guess you can put enough spice on anything to make it taste what you, what, what you <laughs> want, but it's- I guess so. It, it's just the thought of it, right? Remember that guy in the States, I think he was a dentist, maybe a doctor, and he uh, shot a lion over in Africa. I think he, from what I understand, everything was done above board, legally and- 100% legal. And he posted it on social media and he was getting death threats. Dr. Walter Palmer- Okay. He came, he used to come to the Cabela store I used to work at. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, he, had he been guilty of what they accused him of, and then they found out he wasn't. Right. It would have been a $300 fine. Like it wasn't even a, it was, you know, breaking the law is breaking the law. So it's yeah. not right, but they hadn't. Right. And, uh, it's an area I've hunted real close to where he shot that lion. Okay. And the national park boundary, they come and go all the time. And that's right. all it was. It came out of the park and they shot the lion. Okay. And the big thing, funny thing there is they called it Cecil the lion. Oh, you name it, right? Yeah, you name it. And that's the first thing, okay. but no self-respect in Zimbabwean is going to name a lion after the big oppressor Cecil Rhodes. Mm. So it was fabrication right from the start and they played on heartstrings, people who didn't know and... And when I talked to people over there about it, cause I hunted there since mm-hmm. and like the locals would never name something Cecil. No kidding. Yeah. We'll no, just watch a watch. It keeps, oh, oh, there we go. Not, not in positive light anyways. Right. Right. Yes. So. Um, so is that something that, uh, you've had to deal with is people, uh, I don't, I don't see you posting a whole bunch of, uh, stuff that would be controversial on social media, but if you had to deal with, uh, uh, individuals who are just adamantly against us, who might not have the background or knowledge of, of what you're doing. Yeah. I've had death threats. Uh, the first one we thought was kind of comical. Uh, it was back when I was in Michigan in the gun library, we put pictures up of stuff we'd shot, credibility in the gun library. Mm. And I put a picture up of a giraffe I shot. Okay. And, um. One of the guys from work sent me a link. Hey, check out this link. And here, here was this blog and they were going to find the guy who killed this giraffe and come get him. And my picture was on the blog. I thought it was comical. So I jumped on the blog and asked the guys what they wanted to meet. And of course, no one piped up. Mm. I don't think it's so jovially anymore. It is a dangerous situation. Some of these people are quite fanatical. Mm. And with the family and stuff, it's any death threat I get now, I deal with it accordingly. I have contact authorities and, and, um, try getting it dealt with because it is, what I'm doing is legal, Mm -hmm. science, conservation based. And there's a reason I do it. I, I enjoy it for one, but it's, it's money back in the environment. It's things working. Mm -hmm. It's managing the herd, right? Yeah. If somebody's going to threaten you, whether it's a death threat or just a threat in any way, shape or form, one thing I've learned is you never laugh them off. No. You always take it seriously. Worst case scenario, you're wrong. Yeah. The other way around, worst case scenario, I'd rather be wrong acting accordingly than treating it as if it was a joke. Yeah. The whole hunting thing draws very heavy emotions from both sides. Mm -hmm. And you get fanaticals on both sides too. And 
like I said earlier, bad apples, but it seems like the anti-hunting movement is based in a whole lot of things on emotion mm. without any science, with very little science behind it. And, and that's one thing we see over and over again. I mean, when we're talking about, uh, uh, wolf culling over here and we're talking about caribou herds and, uh, everyone talks about, oh, this is, there's no science. This is all emotion. Then you're reacting to it. And then people will pull out or cherry pick their science or cherry pick their stats. And I don't know if it was Disraeli that said it, but someone attributed it to him. He says, you know, there's liars, damn liars and statisticians, right? You can make that look any way you want. Um, how do you start separating that emotion to be able to, uh, articulate what it is that you're doing or do you bother? Like, do you just let people have their emotions and you say, look at what I'm doing is legal. It's helping the environment. It's based on conservation. Like, where do you fall in that? You have to kind of take it and, um, try to weigh your audience to see, see if you have any chance of making any headway. Mm. And it's, I've seen it. I've converted a few people, mm -hmm. but there are some people you can't convert. Mm -hmm. When I lived in the States, it's a little, little different topic, but very similar. Gun control and, and the classic word machine gun. Mm. One of my one, good friend I worked with, he had his class three, he had a bunch of neat stuff and he had an old original Tommy gun. Right. And we would take people out who were anti-gun, anti-machine gun, nobody should own this. Nobody knows what, what it takes to own them, mm. the cost of them and and all the licensing, you could take the biggest anti-gun person, give them that Tommy gun and you couldn't remove their smile with a jackhammer after. <laughs> they might not be pro-gun, right? but they come out with a different point of view, especially when they start talking and asking questions about how much it costs to get a gun, a legal gun, mm. and the paperwork and the background checks and all your tax stamps and stuff. And they realize that these things aren't for sale in the street corners. No. They're a heavy investment. Well, how is, cause of course we've been under a liberal government for the last number of years, looks like things might be changing based on polling and where things are at. People are getting tired of the same old, same old and where that's been leading them. But one of the big pushes that you've been seeing is of obviously on the firearm side yes. and trying to restrict or eliminate classes of firearms. How has that been impacting your livelihood and the business that you work with. Have you been seeing that as a, uh, significant threat? Substantial downturn mm. with loss of handguns, handgun sales, mm -hmm. ammunition sales and handgun calibers are, have slowed down as well. Mm. You don't sell as much shoot two three as you used to. No. And it's, it's definitely a threat. They're not going to stop with what they have now. I think they made that pretty darn clear. Yeah. It's, if they were basing it on actual science and crime re reports and listening to the chief of police and all that kind of stuff, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not you and me causing the problems. Well, the police don't even back it no. up. They used no, to they have, don't. Hey, you know, chief of police, you, union yeah. of police officers and, uh, they're, they're backing this. They don't even yeah. have that. No. It, it won't make any difference because it's not the legal guy that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, a handful of guns get stolen every year and, it's, and it shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. But in the courts, the guys get caught stealing the gun and they're, they're out before the, the, the paperwork's finished. They're in, they're out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's funny the tie between the firearm side that we see, the emotions involved there, as well as on the hunting side, the second you name the animal, the second it's furry and fuzzy, you don't see, you see, um, uh, seals, they're cute and big eyes and baby seals and all the rest. And so they'll be the poster child on a, on a anti-hunting, uh, campaign. You don't see slugs and eels and, uh, the, the ugly critters out there. No, it's only the, only the cute ones. Yeah. Is there a case to be made, uh, for hunting, uh, that can, uh, elicit similar emotions? In what way? Well, I mean, if anti-hunters, cause we were talking about this before and you're saying, you know, if, if the, uh, hunting community could get together and work together as a team in the same way that the anti-hunting community will get together, um, man, we'd be an un unstoppable force. Yeah. If the, if the hunting community would be, would be a co cohesive as the antis, we'd mm -hmm. be unstoppable. 
Right. But here you have the bow hunters against these people. Oh, you hunt with a crossbow. You're not a real archer. Mm. And it just goes down that road. Right. It, it's never ending. It's global. It, 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 we're, this industry or this pro- sport is full of A-type personalities. Mm. And everybody wants wants to have their their voice heard and, and they're the most important way of hunting. Mm-hmm. SCI fights for all hunting. doesn't make a difference. And I use the term sport. And I don't even like using that when I talk about hunting. Sport hunting term came from my research on it, came way back when they actually actually have market hunting. Okay. So the guy would say, I'm going hunting. Are you, is that for your job? No, it's my sport. I'm going out for my own enjoyment. It's not a sport like football is, but it was a recreational activity where the guy could fill his freezer and do that kind of, he wasn't going out to sell the meat. He's going out for his own, own use. I, I heard uh, Ron Spomer recently come up and he's like, you know why it's called sport hunting? He says, because there are rules and regulations and limits to what you're like any other sport. It's not just go out there and, and kill whatever is out there. There's very strict protocol that needs to be cut and followed, which is why they call it sport. So that, yeah. was, that was his take on it. I thought, you know. That's that, very well said. I, I thought so as well. And the, I, I know in the province here, everyone's talks about, you look in our provincial, uh, websites and legislation and everything, they talk about sport hunting and everyone says, we've got to get rid of that term. It's such a bad term. Yeah. Well, do we need to get rid of that term or do people need to understand? Need to educate. Right. We, it's a sport, not in the same way, like, ha this is a fun sport. It's going and kill something. No, there are strict protocol that we have to follow. We need to be able to harvest only within certain times of the day, certain times of the year, certain species, certain uh, age groups, and we need to use all, all of the animal and it's all done in conjunction with uh, biologists who are looking at uh, reproduction rates and uh, what's going to be the best for the environment. Carrying capacity to land and all that stuff. That's right. Another one that's real bad connotations is trophy hunting. Okay, and yeah. It, it, people look at me. And I say, I'm a trophy hunter mm. and they, they just go off irate. So well, let me give you an example. You have a field of 14 deer out there, mm-hmm. seven or bucks. You have seven trophy hunters. You have six bucks left in the field when, when, when the hunt's over. Mm-hmm. You have seven meat hunters. They're all gone. They're all gone. Right. It, it's, I haven't shot, I've not shot game before because it was raining mm-hmm. and I didn't want to deal with a wet animal in the rain. Mm. I mean, it's, I enjoy being out there. Yeah. It was nice. I don't know what, but it wasn't, I didn't have to take it. I didn't have to fill the freezer, mm-hmm. but anything I do take, everything is used. Mm. Not that African standard, but it, it, <laughs> everything, everything's used. I, you, I, you're not uh, deep frying up the, uh, the colon. Yeah, and <laughs> no, I, I do a lot of, I make a lot of biltong and drawer wars. I it's, love biltong. It, the South African dried meat and dried sausage. What was the other one you said? Drawer wars? Drawer wars, dried sausage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know that's what it's called, but yeah. I, I quite like that. I, I make quite a bit of it. And uh, a lot of times I'm running to the store when they have ground beef on sale, I'm making it with that. But okay. otherwise I'm using loose term venison, all, all the stuff I, all the stuff I shoot, whether it's antelope or moose or elk. It's, I find it's got to have a good fat cap on it for the biltong just to be just Yeah. Right. It's, I was on a hunt in Africa and it was probably, I posted a picture. And it's wait three, it's four times, three or four times more fat than there is, than there is meat, but it's, it's the, it absorbs the flavor differently, the yeah. texture. If people look at me and I say, well, try it first. And then yeah. try it. It's like, oh, I didn't think it'd be like that. You know, it's, it's good. <laughs> yeah. And it's an excellent energy source. Like if I'm doing a fly-in hunt, I'll have biltong with me. Yeah. Is this basically a little bit of vinegar on it mm. with some coriander and salt and pepper and dried that's all it is, That's eh? all it is. But over in Africa, don't they just dry it out on rocks? Is yeah, that... they still will use vinegar. Okay. Just as an antibacterial, I, I believe. I could be wrong on that. It adds flavor as well. Right. And I've done, we went on a tuna fishing trip, so I made a bunch up and I had all the different types of vinegar mm. and it did make a difference in flavor. So what's the best vinegar to use? Malt. You mean, you're... Brown malt vinegar is my brown favorite. Malt. Yeah. Okay. But I use like... Uh, red wine, apple cider, white, and brown malt. And brown malt I found was the best. Do you put it in a dehydrator or what do you do? How, how do you? I built my own, uh, just, just pulling warm air over it. That's it, eh? And then you always that thing, how, how dry, some guys like it moist, some guys mm-hmm. like it bone dry. 
three or four days and then it's done for me. Okay. And it lasts pretty long. Never goes rotten because you're, you're eating it, right? <laughs> That's what It doesn't I find. last that long. I mean, yeah. N- never tried it that way because it doesn't last long enough. So, with the difficulties that firearms businesses are facing under the current legislation and their current government, uh, are there is Corth Group hiring? Are they uh, are they kind of holding holding the pattern right now? We're holding the pattern. The warehouse is always looking for good people to mm-hmm. to work. Yeah, in Okotoks there. The rep group, we got a pretty solid group. Everybody lives a lifestyle. Mm. It's not just a bunch of salesmen. And I'm proud to say that. Nice. And I was lucky when I started with Korth, I didn't know what to expect. And, um, they had basically everything I was using already. So I didn't have to sell myself short on anything. Perfect. Everything that the, all the lines we had is stuff I had at home already. Perfect. I've been diehard loopholed for a long time. Yeah. When I graduated high school, I bought myself Webby Mark V and I put a loophole on it. <laughs> and then when I got done with the university, I went and bought myself a high-end European scope. Okay. Wouldn't hold zero. Really? When I, when I was guiding my particular one, I'd have to check my rifles with new clients all the time. Went back to loophole, never had that happen. Interesting. They're man-made. Sure. Anything can happen. Sure. They have a warranty. We can fix them right in Okotoks. Generally speaking, they'll spend more time with Canada Post than they'll spend with us. Really? And I've never had one lose zero. On one African hunt, I had an adjustment. I had to make some adjustments on my gun and the O-ring, the seal on the adjustment came out. Mm. Didn't affect performance. Sure. If if hunting coastal Alaska, might have been a different thing, but. It'd be an issue. I was hunting Matetsi in Zimbabwe and it was dry. Yeah. Wasn't an issue. Sent it back, had it back in a week. Well, don't you guys have a range in your basement as well? Yeah. We have uh four 25 yard pistol base and yeah. 200 yard rifle base. So we can go down there and check zeros and, uh, repeatability. We had a guy come in once, uh, send a scope back, would, wouldn't hold zero. Mm. And they had, he was on a, on a 378 Weatherby. So the tech came to me and this is when I was working there. He goes, Hey, what's the biggest gun you have at home? We put a scope on. So mm. I got a 500 A square. We'll bring it in. We got to test it. <laughs> so I shot literally three, three holes touching with it. The scope held zero. Okay. It's just a guy was afraid of his gun. Mm. How often do you find that? Most of the time. Really? Yeah. The, 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 this stat goes back a few years, but I believe it was Leupold made more scopes in three months than all the European companies did in a year combined. Holy crow. Out of those three. Out of those scopes, did I say scopes or guns? Any scopes. scopes. Yeah. Out of those scopes, 3% would come back for warranty. Okay. Out of that 3%, one third of 1% was actually defective. The rest was user error. Now it's kind of like websites or technology. Person's like, it's not working. And so the person, have you reset your computer? Oh, it works now. Okay. Or are you clicking on the right thing? Right. Oh, okay. So there's got to be a heavy education piece in there yeah. as well. We'd have people send them back. I put my scope in the safe and now I take it out. It's, it's reset itself to factory defaults. Oh yeah. That's. It doesn't do that. Like totally, it, totally happens. It, it, <laughs> people's a bet, betting issue. The biggest thing is a lot of people think all these rifles we're shooting are square. Mm. But like you have all these different axes. So you have the line of the board to the line of the action. Yeah. And is it threaded straight? Is the barrel threaded straight, the action threaded straight. Yeah. I used to have some long 648 screws, probably six, eight inches long. Okay. I used to screw them into the action holes and look, look back and show people and they, they didn't line up. They were close, but you don't see it when it's short, but when you sure. have them long, it, it, you could see how far they were out. Totally. Yeah. yeah. That's an interest. I never thought about doing that. Yeah. It, it's, we live in a world of tolerance, if not absolutes. Right. And making a, a base square mm-hmm. is easy. But the first thing that gets blamed is the optic, mm. then it's the ammunition, and it's never the nut behind the trigger, which is usually <laughs> the problem. Yeah. You know, I, I remember there is, so prior to being uh, Silver Core Outdoors, it was Silver Core Training, and it was Silver Core Gunworks, and would do firearms repair and maintenance for the general public, as well as for uh, different law enforcement groups who do extended work, um, armored car companies, and there's one government group that, um, were doing all of their, their handguns, all of their pistols. And, um, I would get called on down to where they're training on a training day with a bunch of fresh recruits. And they like, the gun's not working and you got to get this fixed. You got to get it right for us. And 
And I said, well, have you, and this would be the instructors, right? Well, have you shot it? Well, no, but the student, it was all over the place. And, and they said, and so, okay, well, let me see. And they, they got the whole class there watching me and the instructors there watching me. And I take it out and they run the target all the way to the end for me. This is how you got to test your accuracy. I'm like, okay, here we go. All right. I better, better make sure I do my part. Everything here is watching. All the bullets go exactly where they're supposed to go. And it comes back. Oh, what'd you do? I'm like, oh, you know, in front of everyone. Oh, I made a few tweaks on it. It shouldn't be a problem anymore. And then separately aside with the instructor, next time you call up, make sure you get a second person to take some shots on it. And that should be the number one thing. I would think that any, any company would say, it wasn't performing for you. Did you give it to somebody else who you know to be proficient that it wasn't performing for? I always tell people, if you keep your eyes open, your accuracy improves too. <laughs> <laughs> there was another case when I was out of the office in Okotoks, a tech said, Hey, I got to test some scopes for an agency. Sure. So we had two Kimber rifles at that point, the 308, I can use police tactic. I can't remember exactly which model it was, mm. but they were known shooters. Mm. So we had them all in rings. We went up to the Rosebud range and we sat a hundred yards and we shot groups and just cut them out and attached them to the scope and sent them back. Mm. Then the agency contacted him wanting to know what rests we were using because they wanted to buy the same so they could t test it themselves. Mm. And you back, no, no, little shot off sandbags. The Alberta, I was a Alberta rep at the time. He goes, the Alberta rep and myself, mm. we just shot them off sandbags and they couldn't believe it. No and, and this is ERT stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of qualified ERT people out there. Yep. But there's. Sometimes ego gets in the way too, right? It's Something's not going to, right. Can't eight, be me. <laughs> back to A-type personalities, right? Well, that's it. You know, we are a group of individuals. People who find solace in the outdoors typically don't want to be surrounding themselves with a whole bunch of other people, right? Yeah. Uh, people who want to uh, hunt or fish or they're typically people who are self-sufficient and they have their way of doing things as has worked for them in the past. Uh, even just in the firearms community, there are some social aspects to that, but even in there, there's a lot of A-type, uh, individualistic type uh, personalities. And I think that's probably... The number one thing that the, uh, hunting community and the firearms community has to recognize and square themselves with if they want to all work together. Yeah. I find a lot of the old wives tales from 40 years ago aren't dying or even 50 years, 60 years ago. Like which ones? Uh, how a bullet flies through the air and, and a scope gathering light. Nothing gathers light. It transmits <laughs> light. It doesn't gather light. Tell me about that. Or people think it gathers light because we, when you look through the scope, if you're low light situation, like last light, you're out and you look and it looks brighter through your scope. Well, now it's focused to your eye. Right. And it's coming right back to your pupil. Mm -hmm. you go, well, I need a, a, a bigger lens. We'll f gather, gather more light. No, your erector system inside the scope is the same size. Mm -hmm. The transmission is, is the same. Mm -hmm. It will affect your exit pupil. Right. But a lot of that times when you get to our age, our eyes, our pupils aren't expanding that much anymore, anymore. It doesn't help anything. Right. Within reason. There's always, some of the higher power scopes are huge. Like when I was culling in, in New Zealand, I had a three and a half, 10 of my rifle and I was doing quite good, but I went back to next season and I was going to be the bad guy. I was, mm. I was going to rack up numbers. I put a six and a half, a 20 on my, on my gun. Mm -hmm. Target dot and I had it dialed. Sure. Cranked it up to 20 power and just made a fool of myself. Because <laughs> early morning, you could, it wasn't a knife, exit people wasn't big enough. Right. Then your field of view was so small, you're trying to find these goats around. And, you, and then I ended up cranking it back down to 10 and left it there and got my numbers back up. That's yeah, usually, it, it, it's, it's amazing how that works, eh? Yeah, it's, would have been cheaper keeping it, right? <laughs> but it's one of the things, it, it's all this stuff, like the, my calling in the South Pacific really taught me a lot. Old, like, testing these old wives tales with different bullets and stuff. Cause you go down and you're shooting quantities of animals. Mm. You could shoot in, in a day what you couldn't shoot in several lifetimes here. Really? And so with different bullets and stuff, it really taught me what worked and what didn't. So this, the whole culling aspect, they take a look, it's usually with invasive species yeah. and they say they're overrunning. It's going to cause damage to the environment and to the other species in here. Well, Carrying capacity is diminished. Yeah. Now we had a, um, a call here over in BC, uh, one of the local little islands here, 
and they will bring people in. You were going to New Zealand, and these guys were New Zealand fellows that were coming, coming over here. Coming over here. I was. I helped him out with that a little bit in the beginning. Okay. As the loophole Hornady rep. Okay. I tried talking to them, and they wouldn't listen. And their second purchase was more geared to what I, what I told. Mm. But I think the whole thing was wrong. You're paying a company come come in here, kill deer when you and I would have done it for free. You could have had a draw. Sure. Yeah, it's a national park. Okay, well, you have it a draw basis. When I lived in Detroit, we used to, we always talked about guardian piles of corn mm. in the metro parks in downtown Detroit. Okay. They would stack co- corn up, get all the deer coming in. Mm. And then in middle of winter, we would guard the pile of corn and shoot any deer that tried to eat it. <laughs> and and all, all, the, all the meat went right back to the homeless shelter. Homeless. Sure. It was all processed through Whitetails Unlimited. Yeah. But I mean, that wasn't invasive, but it was just the metro parks. You couldn't control it any other way. You can't, mm. you couldn't open it up in the cities. Right. I feel if we did a call like that in a metropolitan area in Canada, there'd be such outcry. But down there, they, I'm not sure if they're still doing it. This goes back mm. 20 some years now, but it was always, it was always interesting. And then that was muzzle loader only. Mm. And we would try different bullets and that's a my terminal ballistics fascination was always, I'd go to New Zealand, I'd have my, so much of my regular go-to bullet mm-hmm. and I'd try a few new ones that were on the market and see how they worked. And when you can try a bullet on 50 different animals in a day, mm. it's not, it, it's a much broader snapshot than just that focus. Well, you tried it once, it didn't work, it didn't, right. maybe that was a one-off, but came pretty apparent what worked and what didn't. What do you find works for you? Most of my culling bullet was the Hornady interlock. Okay. Even before I worked for Hornady. Okay. And it was performed very good. Yeah. And they were economical when you're shooting that kind of volumes. Mm. Yeah. It's I'm good. talking hundreds of rounds a day, right? Like it's, mm. and it made a difference if you were shooting some of the stuff that was four or five times the price. And we experimented with them and I found the best bang for the buck was the Hornady interlock. Interesting. So what I heard back from the, the local culling that was over here, um, they said, well, why are you bringing people in from New Zealand to do this? I said, well, they're the ones with the expertise and they're going to be shooting from helicopters and they're going to blah, 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 blah. Buddy of mine, he flies helicopters. He's like, you know, we train the New Zealanders how to shoot from helicopters, right? Uh, Canadians know how to do this. I've right? shot from helicopter in New Zealand. Yeah. I'm hundred percent success rate in helicopter. Okay. Never missed a shot. Okay. I've only taken one. <laughs> but I, I, that was going to be my <laughs> next question. <laughs> that was going to be my next question because that'd be a pretty darn impressive shooting from a moving helicopter. It was, um, we were, we were culling tar okay. and, um, uh, it ran into the bullet. Okay. Like it, yeah. it, it's, I act like it was all me, sure, but, but sure. it's, you want to try again? Nope. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just rest so, on my laurels here. Yeah. No, it was. It was a lucky shot, sure. but I mean, I always tell people I'm hundred percent from helicopter, which isn't a lie, but that's, that's <laughs> another one of those stats things, right? Like right. statistically, I'm not telling the, I'm te- statistically, I'm telling the truth, Yeah. but it's, it's a very, very small cross section. Well, I, I heard there is no, um, no Canadians, uh, put in for the, uh, for the call. I don't know if that's true or not, or if that was just something that was, uh, said afterwards, but. So I never, I never heard it being offered to anybody. I, I never did either. Because but. when I, when we were involved with it, it was Parks Canada trying to do it themselves. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting anyways. I mean, you know, they've got a reason, they've got a, they've gone through, they've looked at the science, they've looked at why they need to do this, but the next step seemed a little ridiculous. The amount of money that's spent in the, uh. Didn't it, didn't it work out like $83,000 a deer? I think it was something like that. Yeah. It's just brutal. Yeah. I don't understand that, but, um. Interesting. I hunted on the, on the islands there a couple of years back and we weren't welcome there. No? By most of the people, it was clear they didn't want us there. A few, a few guys were fine. Right. But so now they have the problem of the deer. Well, it's everybody wants their cake and eat it too, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're cute and they, they're little guys and they're, they're like little pets and they come by all the time. But you can't stick your finger into the bowl of water and not expect to see some ripples. Yeah. There's going to be a consequence one way or the other. And I guess we come to a point where you either say, 
okay, the consequence is, is the environment's changed completely. Or you get in there and you try and make some changes to, to correct some of the mistakes that were made. But it's a textbook example of how managing herds and hunting can help not only the herd, but the, but the landscape and the, and the carrying capacity of the land. Mm-hmm. Keep it healthy. Mm-hmm. And people have to realize that people, biggest thing that antis don't understand are animal rights people. Well, you're killing an animal. Yeah, you're not managing for the individual. You're managing for the herd long term. Mm. And you have to give some stuff up for it to be viable long term. Yeah, because the consequence otherwise is they all, they starve to death. Yeah. The disease comes in, wipes them out and. Right. You, you take a look what's happening in the prairies and in the states with CWD now. Mm. It, and that was from, supposedly coming from the deer farming, crowded pens mm-hmm. and it disease wipes stuff out. Is that where it came from? That's the story I heard. CWD, chronic yep. wasting disease yep. for anyone who's listening who doesn't quite. Um, and that's, I think it's in Alberta now. Yep. Any reported cases in British Columbia? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think there is yet. Do you think it's coming? I don't know. I sure hope not. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, just, it's decimating populations. And I, I never, I never heard about where they were speculating where he came from. So that's interesting. I hunted Alberta this fall for antelope. Okay. And in what was once a prime mule deer area, mm. there wasn't a mule deer left. They wiped them out. Not because that they purposely culled them all out, mm. is my understanding, just so the disease wouldn't spread. Now that what comes back should be healthy. But you have to manage that too. I know every deer you shoot in Alberta, when, ones I've shot, you submit a head for testing. Right. And then if it comes back positive, they give you another tag and they don't recommend eating it. They say it can't jump to the human, but you don't want to be that I didn't case rea- number one. I didn't realize they gave another tag. I thought you were Maybe just, that, maybe that stopped, out. but I know at first it was guys I was hunting with when I lived there were getting replacement tags. Okay. One year we, we got, you got drawn and you go buy your tag and you get two tags next year, next year it's three. I heard one year of it being six when mm. they're trying to get rid of them. They're quite aggressive on managing it there. So I got to ask right now, shot shows on, how did you manage to get out of that one? Like for me, I have a hard time at shot. It is too many people, too busy, too much stuff. I'd rather be in the ocean, up a mountain, in the woods. Shot's a tough place for me. Yeah. Shot opens tomorrow. It is, to go and work it is one thing, to go and visit it as a consumer, I guess mm. it's not consumer, it's industry related, yep. but to go there as a guest is a different thing. Mm-hmm. It was lots of fun the first couple of years. Sure. If I had to be there, I'd be there, put my best foot forward, yep. but it, it is, it is four days of grinding it out mm. nonstop. You can barely walk, wall, halls are so full, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. And I'm just not a crowd person, but no, I, it's half the crew's there. I'll be there yep. next year. Okay. And it's, it's a phenomenal place. Like you realize how small the Canadian market really is when, when you walk through shot. I got to wonder why they even care, even listen to us, honestly. I mean, it's, we are so small. Yeah. We're th- anywhere from three to 7%, uh, depends who you talk to. And we make their life difficult by having all these weird import export laws and yeah. Yeah. And magazine restrictions and now that, yeah, it, it's just brutal. You, you, they can't just ship a gun up with, with, by changing, throwing the mag out. They got to do it so, so many, a lot of a hundred or whatever. Mm. And it just changes things. And Have you been keeping up on the, uh, the newer magazine laws that they're talking about here in Canada? I know enough to be dangerous. Um, I've been trying to keep up with it. What's actually, once it passes, I will, I will educate myself hundred percent on it, mm. but there's so much speculation out there and stuff. I wanted, I don't want to get myself confused. Mm-hmm. I live in enough places and hunted enough places that naturally I'm getting stuff mixed up. Well, sure. where was this? How do I, yep. just because I've lived in different places and things have changed and. Yeah. From what I understand, they're looking at, uh, pinned magazines and magazine capacities and they say, they keep bringing in new regulations and legislation as to the number of rounds that you can have in a magazine. And well, if a restricted fire, you can have 10, but if it's a non-restricted center fire, semi-auto, you can only have five, but if it's 
uh, restricted that kind of looks like a non-restricted. It's five again, but if it takes the pistol mags and it's 10, they said, tell you what, anything that's pinned uh, is going to be made prohibited is what I'm hearing. I heard the same thing. And then like we get stuff up from Ruger mm-hmm. and they won't be pinned to be dimpled. Right. And because pinning is not legal in some states because mm. it could be removed. Right. So they dimple the mag and they're si- simply with a hammer, they probably have a jig, they put it in the hammer yep. and a punch and it deforms the mag. Mm. And then they get people upset with that because the mag's deformed. Well, you know, pinning is not legal. So this is what it is. And we aren't big enough for them to, to, to do it. Yeah, I remember back in the day when uh, Vancouver Police here, they transitioned from their Bredas to their SIGs and it was my job to dimple thousands of magazines and yeah. that's exactly what I did. Made a little jig, slide the thing in, get the torch just to heat it and then give it a smack, bring it out. So they all mm-hmm. have a little bit of discoloration from the torch and a little bit of a dimple, but they're all in the same place and made them legal again for them to be able to sell it prior to then, uh, enforcing some, uh, legislation or regulations that were on the books about law enforcement being able to recoup costs through. Yeah. The, the, uh, my understanding, they can't anymore. They can and they can't. I mean, the legislation was on the books, um, but they just weren't enacting it. Some stuff happened. They decided they're going to enact it. And from what I understand, there is a little bit of a, um, it's a bit of a gray area. I think they came down really hard and said you can't. The same reason why, let's say, safety course instructors in Canada, they used to get all of their firearms through seized guns from the police stations. And they'd, in BC, they'd either come over to, at the time, it was uh, Murray Charlton who was doing it, or myself. And we would be um, deactivating, or the, now they call it disabling, a, a firearm so that it'll still click and it'll still do what it's got to do. And but it'll never go bang again. Yeah. And we get it all from the police and then they said, you can't do that anymore. And I think that's starting to lax up a bit. I have certain areas, I, I still hear instructors saying, oh, I went to my local RCMP and they put some aside for me. So a lot, there's a lot of officer discretion involved. Yes. And it depends where you are. Mm-hmm. I know I have some friends who are members and, uh, they're night and day, how they interpret things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like calling up the firearms program. Yeah. You can call five different times and get eight different answers. Yeah. Interesting world that we try and navigate, create, make sure that like operating a business, I, I got to imagine it's got to be incredibly difficult for a company as large as the one you work with to, uh, operate under the auspices of certain rules and regulations only to have somebody else interpret it differently the next day. And this is why we draw, the company makes policies that are black and white and people want to see, well, can't you help me? No, we're black and white. We have to be. Mm -hmm. There's too many variables involved and we've been advised or or we, the the company feels that this is what it means. Mm -hmm. So we stick to that and we don't deviate from it. Do you guys seek permission or do you seek, um, do you say this is what we're doing? Does it meet, do you look for tacit approval? Do you look... For it, because if you want to get everything in writing, you're going to be waiting years. Yeah. That's above my pay grade. Okay. It it comes down to me. I just follow what I'm told. Sure. Fair enough. So (laughs) I, I've, yeah, I don't need to put that responsibility on myself. (laughs) If if someone else is going to do it, I'll listen and do exactly what I'm told. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Where do you see the future of, uh, of firearms in, in Canada and, and hunting? That's a tough one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if something doesn't change now, yeah, it's not going to be a good future. And that, that can be interpreted in many ways. Mm. And that's just how I feel though. It, it's brutal what we're going through as history repeats itself. You can draw all these parallels from other regimes and stuff. And some of the stuff's word for word. You talk to some people and they say, you know, the writing's on the wall. I mean, it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, I got to wonder what would have to happen in order for that not to go down that course. There has to be a change in government. Mm. I mean, that, that's, that's the first, but can the Canadian, will the Canadian public allow the next government, give them enough leeway and time to fix what it is where most Canadians can't buy green bananas to plan ahead. And, and they aren't, they aren't going to be able to sit here and wait for 
the cons- if say the conservative party is going to be our savior, mm. they aren't going to give them two terms to fix what the last guys did. Right. They're going to, oh, this is, as soon as they, as soon as they start tightening the belt and stuff, they're going to, oh, it was better the other way. And mm-hmm. it's just, they, they can't see the future. Well, I, I look at COVID, all of a sudden there's a resurgence in people wanting to be able to be self-reliant, to get outside. Obviously, uh, self-protection was another one. Yep. They uh, kind of brought it to the forefront. And I guess if I'm to be pessimistic, I'd say that's probably the only thing that will course correct. Even different governments coming in might slow or bait these different, uh, the, the course that we're on, but it's going to take either natural disaster, war, something catastrophic in order for people to reevaluate, um, what they find important. I, I've been saying that for a while. It's going to take an act of God or a catastrophic event mm-hmm. to get the country back on, on, on the right course, mm-hmm. especially if we get another liberal government in. Mm-hmm. And I say, I, I'm not picking on the liberals here because Mulroney's conservatives and Kim Campbell brought a bunch of this crap in. Sure. Yeah. So it, it's, it's the best way to look at it. They're, they're, they're all in the same party. It's just different money wings, right? Well, I, I look at it and I know, you know, the macro politics are going to be different from the micro politics, but I remember, and I were years ago, here we are in the corporation of Delta, which is now the city of Delta. And at the time, the corporation of Delta says, we don't want any more firearms related businesses in Delta, similar to what Surrey has done. If you're in there, you're grandfathered, but uh, that's it, no more, right? And so I went in there and I had myself all prepared and got my suit on and I've got all my notes and I'm in there and I'm talking, giving all my different points. And you know, that there was one, uh, firearm business that thought this was the greatest thing in the world because they were close to retirement and this was just make it, um, it was a short sighted approach. And, um, I didn't see eye to eye with that individual on that one point, great person, but just that one point I didn't see eye to eye on. Anyways, I'm giving my spiel and one of the guys stands up, one of the politicians says, Travis, like how, how much longer are you going to go here? <laughs> and it's, cause he sees all my notes and I says, well, I don't know. I got this much more to go through. And he's like, let me just stop you short. I agree with everything you're saying. This has got nothing to do with what makes sense. And it's got everything to do with what we think the people want. Oh. I didn't know how to respond to that, right? He says, yeah, no, you're right. Nothing here really makes sense, but this is what we think the constituents who elected us in want. And I look at that more on the macro side. Is this what people actually want? I think people want safety. They want security, but I think the story that's being told over and over again either through, either inadvertently through, let's say media, which glorifies firearms and in a certain way, or through, um, like legacy media and social media and all the rest that may be objective driven to, to paint a picture in a certain way. They'll say, you know, firearms are bad or hunting is bad. And the majority of people say, well, yeah, you know, I want to be safe. I don't want to walk out and see everybody carrying around a gun. Cause that doesn't make me feel safe. I don't want to see people out there hurting these poor animals because, you know, I'd rather just get it from the abattoir and don't, don't you just get meat from Safeway? And I think there's an education piece in here that can bridge the gap of what people actually want because they want safety and security and they want their environment to thrive and the animals to do well and how we get there. And I think there's, there's a, a divide in there that we aren't adequately bridging at the moment. No, and it's uphill battle because like you say, the media is giving people what they want. Right. And, and, and it's the politician, all the politician wants is another term mm-hmm. and it keeps on going that way. If it was all based on science and common sense and all that kind of stuff, it wouldn't be an issue. It's based on money. Yeah. Follow the money. Right. Me- media doesn't sell stories, they sell advertising right? They want eyes on so they can convert that and there's going to be money involved or there's going to be money back through the government if certain governments are in power that are favorable to the media. And I think people are starting to wake up to that. You know, just all the, um, 
fake news, all, all the, like what Trump, Trump would go on about. I think people are waking up to the amount of bias that's out there, but it also creates a very dangerous category where people just can't believe anything. They don't know what to believe and then something yeah, comes well, across as plausible. Yeah, well, if you look at how many of these tinfoil hat conspiracy theories mm. have that have been proven correct and actually exist mm. in the last three years? Like it's, it's just brutal. I actually got my tinfoil hat back there. You can <laughs> see it up behind me. I haven't had a chance to wear it yet. I'm just waiting for some guests to come on with some real tinfoil stuff and I'll put the, my hat on. But yeah, I was in Africa when COVID hit and I flew back through four or five major airports around the world yeah. after the lockdown. Yeah. And all I can say is my firsthand experience for what that's worth. Mm. This and two bucks will get you coffee at Timmy's. <laughs> it's how they were talking about the lockdown being ha handled in all these countries and all these wasn't the case. Mm. I, I, I seen it myself completely different. Did it change right after I left or was it like that before I came? I don't know. Mm. But I went through these places and it wasn't, wasn't what anything, anything the news was reporting. It was definitely agenda driven. Mm -hmm. And a lot of fear mongering going on. Well, I, I likened it to fog, that whole thing, because I'd talked to people and you know, a fellow in Spain, he was doing some work on one of our websites and he's in Valencia there. And when COVID first hit, he's like, oh, it's bad. Okay. Tell me about this. Right? Like we don't, I'm, yeah. I'm learning here. Oh, you know, the lockdowns are going to happen and people are going to start dying and this and that. Are you seeing that in your area there in Valencia? Well, no, no, but it's, it's over in these other areas. And just like fog, right? Are you, is it really foggy right where you are? Well, no, I can see all around me, but it's really foggy over there. You walk over there and you look around, it's the same thing, right? There's a European vendor we were dealing with and the conversation was, how's it going? And they go, oh, this is great. There's no tourists. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll leave it at that, right? Right. Like, like it was. Well, it also had an effect of on firearms businesses, which was positive in the short term. It's not a sustainable sort of model, but I mean, it got everybody wanting to learn to hunt, wanting to learn to garden, wanting to purchase firearms and you couldn't keep them on the shelves for quite some time. Yeah. There was that time where you had this happening and political stuff happening around the world. And it was a perfect storm for the industry, mm -hmm. but not, not sustainable. No. And we're going through the correction now. It's still, there's still strong sales, mm. but it's, well, even if we went back to quote unquote normal, people would think it's, it, the bottoms dropped out because it was just so, so busy for those few years. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, you're not seeing people wanting to go outside in the same way anymore. It's funny how quickly people can just go back to, well, this is normal. This is, this is easy. The easy path. I guess that's why we have game trails because we are animals just like anything else. This is the easy way and I can, I'll just go back and forth kind of on autopilot. Yeah. Path least resistance. Yeah. Interesting. Um, any other, any inside scoops from the industry that we should be, uh, chatting about? Any up and coming things that you're allowed to talk about? Well, there's nothing real secret now. Everything will be released at SHOT Show, that there type of thing, right? Yeah. Um. On the, on the loophole side of things, they brought the Mark IV back. Okay. And it seemed that Mark IV HD. Yeah. And it looks like they've done a great job on it. Nice. Hit, hit it out of the park. Nice. We'll, we'll see how the sales translate to that. And Hornet is always coming out with these new cartridges and what, a lot of them are designed for military application and then released to the public okay. as a secondary thing. But a lot of that stuff is AR driven and we've mm. lost that market here. Mm -hmm. It'll still work in the bolt gun, but. For the, for the Americans and their ARs, it, it's some neat stuff out there. Do you think, do you think ARs are coming back? I sure hope so. Yeah. I, um, cause they, they're talking about a complete rewrite of the firearms act. It's so patchwork together as it is right now. And it's so open to interpretation. It's, um, it's a little ridiculous. You know, people will call up and they'll say, you know, I, I got this issue, uh, do you know a good firearms lawyer? And I always tell them the same thing. You don't need a firearms lawyer. You just need a good lawyer. Yeah. So, somebody knows who's got a sharp head, who knows procedural law and everything else, because that, that's not where these things are going to be won or lost for you. 
Yeah, the, but it go, comes back to our talk there about educating educating people. Mm. Like so many people, all oh, the semi auto, the auto uh, automatic, is, sure. is everything that's they have no place in the sporting field. Well, actually, they were made for the sportsmen long before the military. Mm. Winchester came out with that self self loading rifle, right? Right, and then the Model Eight. Yeah, and that's where Kalishnikov got his safety for the AK off the Remington Model Eight. Mm. They were built for the hunter at, at early night. Early part of the century, last century, mm-hmm. and the military didn't start using them successfully until the Grand World War Two. Mm-hmm. But but the semi-auto rifle was made for the hunter first. And most people don't think about it like that. No, no. Interesting. So you know, shot show. The one thing I did like about it did send us media passes, so I don't have to pay to get in. I get to go down to the range days ahead of time and. That was always a fun thing. You get to go in, shoot all the new things for free, meet all the people that are out there. Um, is that something that you guys would present at or? Well, the, L, the L, LE guys would yeah. be down there with our various vendors. Okay. On the line and stuff. Yeah. Okay. As we'd separated the, I used to do LE and commercial. Now, yeah. I, now I just do the commercial side of things. Okay. So I'm not dealing with that nearly as much. I'll pick up some slack once in a while. Mm. But I never went down there and shot that. I've done it before in, in previous life and p- played with all that kind of stuff. It, it's fun and I'll let someone else go who hasn't had a chance yet. Yeah, makes sense. I just like free food, free, free f- yeah. shuttle Any, down. Anytime you can shoot a full auto on someone else's ammo bill, that's the way to do it. <laughs> yes. Um, what else? Um, so looking at these African hunts, um, you're saying before, you know, caviar tastes on a, on a peanut butter budget. Um, what advice would you have to somebody else who's looking to, to do the same thing, go on an Africa hunt? It's achievable. That's, that's the bottom line. If you go to vacation, if you go on vacation to Hawaii, Mexico, if you do a cruise, Mm. you can do an African hunt if you want to buckle down and, and do it. Mm -hmm. It's, um. I'm very lucky that the, my key thing that gets me to Africa is my wife. She's hundred percent supportive. Okay. And, and that changes it. That I know people who wives aren't quite as encouraging as when it comes to hunting. My wife's hundred percent behind it. And actually on the hunt I'm going on now, I was going to go shoot a female lion. Okay. On a management hunt. That's going to raise some eyebrows and yeah. get some and, people upset. Uh, I, because the price was in my budget. Mm. And my wife said, no, they're, they're going to close this. It's not going to be something you can do again. Mm. Go, go, go shoot a male. Go shoot the big main lions. Mm. Well, go hunt for them. Whether right. you get one or not, it's a different story. Right. And so she twisted my arm and that's what I signed up for now. Interesting. And like, I, I'm not, I don't have the money. I'm just... Financially <laughs> irresponsible, right? <laughs> so. You got the it, perseverance. Yeah. It's, it's one of the things it's, I wanted, something I never thought I'd ever do. Well, there's also that aspect of, uh, the hunter can be hunted with these yeah, things too. Yeah. It, it's called dangerous game for a reason. Mm-hmm. And then it's part of the big five. Mm-hmm. And I, if you would have told me 15 years ago, I'd be talking about hunting the big five. I would have thought you were nuts. Like there's no way someone in my income and my level could ever do it. Mm. And if I'm successful in the lion hunt, it'll be my number four of the big five. Wow. So, and it's something I've, and it's just chasing things down. A buddy came to me a couple of years ago, asked me if I want to shoot a leopard. Well, of course I want to shoot a leopard, but that's not my income bracket. That's mm. a quarter of my annual salary or more. Mm. I, I can't do that kind of stuff. And he, he well, yeah, you, you give me this, I'll give you a lion, a uh, leopard. And I said, well, what am I missing here? The numbers don't add up. He's no, I'll just, you help me, I'll help you out. Mm. So the right place, the right time. And when I hunted Pakistan, back when uh, I had my friend from Georgia up here, we're hunting the, the bison in Alberta mm. when they were concealed, considered pests, when they didn't need a license or anything. That's just a few years ago. Right. And we were way back up hunting bison and his cell phone rings. There's no cell phone service. But the phone rang. It must have been, I don't know what they call it, skip or whatever. And, sure. And it was one of his pro staff was canceling the Pakistan hunt for that January. Okay. This is our end of September. And so he hung up the phone and he goes, Seaman, do you want to go to Pakistan? What's it going to cost me? He goes, the hunt's free. So you got to get there. I said, well, sign me up. 
<laughs> and that's how I got the Pakistan hunt. And your work's all on board with this. Yeah, we're going to lose you for, for another couple of weeks here. Yeah, well, I, I flew uh, I flew out of Pakistan. I landed the 13th of January yeah. and shot show started the 15th. So I did a quick turnaround and going back to U.S. Customs after visiting Pakistan was interesting. Yeah, I should imagine. But it was one of the things that's, I, I run everything down. Someone offers me a hunt. Mm. I'll run it down and see if it's legit or if the guy's just blowing smoke. Mm. And if I can do it, and the more off the beaten path is more enjoyable, right? Are there many scams out there? Many people uh, run running scam hunts? Yeah, but not as bad as other industries, I'd say. Okay. I mean, there's people not reading the fine print. Mm. Like, like, like a lot of people, these hunting conservation groups, we have fundraisers. Like SCI, we have a fundraiser on April 13th. Mm-hmm. We, have, we have some African auction hunts there. Yep. And you can save some money by buying a hunt there. Mm -hmm. Now, is the hunt going to be pennies in the dollar? Not if you do it right. Mm -hmm. You're going to save a little bit of money. It's still going to cost you. Instead of spending $10,000, you're going to spend eight. Right. But it's, and you can do it for less than that too. Mm. But you just have to, you just have to run them down. Like my first trip to New Zealand was a guy made me an offer and I kind of lost contact with him. I didn't think he was legit. And then I found him and sent him an email and, oh no, the offer stands. Hmm. L- let's do this. And that was my first of nine trips down there. Right. And it was just, but I pursue everything. And a lot of times it's, you're spinning wheels for nothing. Mm. But when it does come true, it's, it, it, it's, it's br- brilliant. I did a hunt over in Molokai. And okay. Was, yeah. I, you know, trying to figure this thing out, hunting in the States and acts as deer. I can bring all the meat back home. This is fantastic. And, um, met some great people over there. I don't know if I'd do that hunt again. Um, just from my perspective, cause I, I met with the, um, uh, some other locals and they said, if you want to hunt, you just let, let me know next time we'll, we'll go out together. That was the hunt that I want to do is with the locals just. Uh, I, I did a recce of the area pr- beforehand. I'm looking around and getting things kind of sorted and, uh, met with the, uh, the fellow there and, uh, he's like, okay, well, let's get in this, uh, great big, it wasn't an Argo, but it was a multi-seater side by side and we'll drive around and so, okay, well, how would I get out here? I'm going to hike over the next hillside and I, I from the wrecking I've been doing, say, no, 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 just sit here. We'll drive you around. We'll try. And it was, it was a different style of hunt than I've ever hunted before. It was interesting for the experience. Got to keep all the meat. It was, uh, I uh, used everything on it, got the hides, all, all the rest, um, made me feel good about myself, but I wanted to put some more legwork in and I wanted to make it a, um, uh, a different type of a hunt. Yeah. So definitely hundred percent, I do access to again, uh, just, in a different way. Do you have that sort of, uh, freedom, uh, if you're doing an African hunt or do you? Well, absolutely. Like I know, like in the place I hunt in Namibia, if you want to walk from the lodge, you can mm. walk from the lodge. Mm. If you want to drive out, you can drive out and get out in stock. Mm. Um, I know I avoided hunting in South Africa for quite a few years because I heard horror stories about South Africa. Yeah, so have I. And, and then I went last year in March with an outfit there. And I was very impressed. Mm. I took my son and and a friend and the outfitter really, the outfitter really spent time with my son and it was brilliant. And it was, there was, there was a fence around the place. Mm -hmm. It was a huge, huge farm. Like how big? Uh, 15,000 acres. That's pretty big. And you know, the animals didn't know the fence was there, Mm. but they knew where every rock was, every tree, every bush. Mm. And I've had many free range, true free range BC hunts here, much easier than that South Africa hunt. Mm. It's that high fence isn't my first choice. Mm. I'm never going to say it is. Right. But the hunt is still a spirit of fair chase and it can be challenging. Right. But then you, you hear stories of guys go up and they're hunting the very small pool table type thing. Like, like this, this go out and shoot and stuff. And that's not for me. No, me neither. Yeah. Um, anytime it became dangerous when you're out there, anytime you've been concerned about, uh, either the environment or the game. In Africa. Yeah. My elephant hunt. Yeah. I have never been more scared in my life. Yeah. But never felt more alive at the same time. 
Well, you never feel quite as alive as when you're almost dead, right? It's uh, and it was truly the most addictive thing I've ever done. Yeah. It's, I'll never be able to do it again just because the costs and stuff. And I just have to be the right place again mm. and, and had a thing. And I first seen a wild elephant in my first trip to Zimbabwe and I thought, wow. And you see him in, in the zoo and stuff. I had no interest. It didn't interest me at all. Yeah, I agree. But, That's... but in the wild, it's a different thing. Yeah. And it's a whole lot more level playing field than people think. If you screw up, someone's You're... getting hurt. Getting stomped. Yeah. And it's, it's not for everybody. Like my PH told me, when you shoot an elephant, you're going to have a very emotional response one way or the other. Mm. And everything is going to be, you're going to not regret doing it, but, but you will never do it again. Interesting. Or everything else you do after this is rats and mice, he said, (laughs) his term. And I had the expensive reaction, of course. Mm. And it, it was most... Amazing thing. We looked over the, my first hunt. I did a hunt, was unsuccessful my first hunt. They let me come back in a second. And we looked over probably 400 elephant. We probably walked 10, 15 miles a day. Mm. And it was incredibly challenging. I couldn't believe the fact that there could be elephants standing in trees 20 yards in front of you and you couldn't see them. Really? Yeah. Like it was just like. 20 yards. 20 yards. And we were driving down the road and there's some elephant tracks across. And I can't even tell which way they're headed because mm. it's just this round disc <laughs> in the sand. Okay. The, the tracker looks at it and says 20 minutes. They're 20 minutes in front of us. And I'm like, yeah, this guy's. Like drinking, Crocodile Dundee type. Drinking all that rotten corn maze, that, that <laughs> corn drink that they drink. And so we jumped out and 20 minutes later, we were in the herd. Wow. And I say in the herd, like you're. 10 yards from them sometimes, you're right there. It's up close and personal. You, you're, when I first booked the hunt, I asked him, well, where do you want, how do you want me to sight my rifle in? Mm. He goes, well, zero at 25 yards. And I said, well, 25 yards? Goes, yeah, don't worry. We won't shoot that far. Won't shoot that far. And, and it was, no, you're right up personal. If something goes wrong, it goes wrong in a hurry. No kidding. And, um, what people don't understand, there's not as many elephants there used to be. Mm. But based on carrying capacity to land, they're overpopulated. Hmm. And that has to do with pl- geopolitical stuff and farming and all that kind of stuff. And they have to manage to herd. Interesting. And then you get to bad apples again. Like there were some fish and game guys, one in the countries there, poised on the water holes. Mm-hmm. And then went and found all the ivory. They killed hundreds. Well, that doesn't help anybody. That's not conservation. I was having sushi with a, uh, a friend and he's... Um, uh, British individual has uh, family over in um, Zimbabwe and anyways, or he gets a text coming through and looks, it makes a bit of a face and I'm like, oh, what's going on? He's like, oh, you don't want to see this. Okay. Yeah. You know what we do with poachers over there? <laughs> anyways, they, they deal with them rather harshly. Yeah. When I was both elephant trips to the Zimbabwe when I was there, the week before there were poachers shot in the area. Yeah. By PHs and stuff. Just yes, line them up and take care of them. But fish and game have no problem with that. National parks, what they're called over there. But hmm. the police department has serious issues with it. Interesting. Yeah. And even though that they, the one, the one time that they were shot at first, they returned fire. But it, it, it's, they, they don't deal with it. I have signs when we're going through an area, don't get out of your vehicle because there's no hunting in the area. Mm. You get and, out, they're going to think you're a poacher. Yeah. And it says right there, if you, if you're out of your vehicle, you'd be dealt with as a poacher and shot in sight. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a different world than what we're used to over here. And poaching there is what's killing African wildlife. It's not the hunters. Well, what's driving the poaching? Obviously there's a market for it, right? It, there is. Yeah. If, if there was no market for it, they wouldn't be going after, they wouldn't be doing it, right? right. Huh. Well, um, what else? Anything else we should be talking about? Oh, there's so much stuff that K- we, K- we start going down these rabbit holes and K- stuff. And Buffalo, there's, uh, uh, they're on the big five, aren't they? Yep. I shot a Cape Buffalo in March. Okay. Past March with my son and. Distance on that? Uh, about 70 yards. Seven zero? Yeah, seven yeah. zero. Okay. And it was, I practiced, I'm on it, shoot as fast as I can, but everything in Africa bites you. Mm. The, the bugs, the trees. And I got tangled up in the tr- bush right in front of me and it grabs onto your skin and incredibly painful. Mm. And the time I got cleared, the buffalo had run 10 yards, turned back, had run another way. Mm. So I hit him on the other side, almost exactly 
mirror image of the other side. Mm -hmm. And he went in this real thick stuff and piled up. Mm -hmm. So then he, I was, we were walking up to him and his tail was still moving. So then I gave him two more with the 458 and that was all she wrote. Mm. And that's a hunt that was great to do with, with my son. Mm. But it's a hunt, I ne another one of my hunts, I never thought I'd be able to do on, on my income, right? Mm -hmm. So and with that hunt, like trying to r run things down, I was serious. I had a budget. Yep. I reached out to three people I knew in the industry. Hey, I want to do a Cape Buffalo hunt. What can you do it for me? Two of the guys came back, well, what's your budget? And the next guy came back with a price. So I went, yeah. I went. I'm not giving you my budget. No, because <laughs> whatever, whatever. Whatever it is, it'll be more. Yeah. It'll be at or more. Yeah. So. Oh, you're in luck. It's exactly that amount. Yeah. It's just like, I, I remember watching one of the duck commander guy and Phil Robinson was talking about when he bought his first lathe, mm. he went to the lathe shop and then I got $30,000. Well, you're in luck. I have one here for $30,000. <laughs> so I, um, I did that. And it, it was a great hunt, great memories. My son shot two head, at, shot an ostrich and a warthog, mm -hmm. and he had a hunt hard for him. And even this quote unquote high fence, I didn't think he was going to get him. Really? Yeah. Like it was. So what would happen if they got rid of that hunting? All the game has to be euthanized. Mm. Like it doesn't get let go. So like with, if South Africa finally shuts down their lion hunting, they have all these lions behind the high wire. And some of these farms are 75,000 acres plus. And people think the anti-hunters, well, we're going to show the hunting and save these lions. Yeah. No, they're going to kill the lions. The lions have to be euthanized. So it, it, you're not saving anything. They just can't put the, the captive lions out into the wild? No. Even though there has been cases where they will survive and will, will breed. Mm. No, they have to be euthanized. For case in point, uh, the guy I was hunting with us in March, his, the property next door sold mm. and there was 75 Bonte buck on it. And Bonte buck looks very close to a Bles buck, okay. but there are CITES endangered animals, okay. endangered species. So the, the other property owner said to my buddy, you can have them for free. Mm. You had to pay to catch them and you can put them on your farm. The government said no one killed them all. Really? Yeah. So like, like there's no rhyme, no reason to it. And why would you just kill and bury 75 of these? No kidding. Even if they weren't endangered. Well, what would the economic outcome be if they got rid of these hunts? Oh, it'd be for the South African farmer yeah. and, 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 and hunter, huge. Yeah. Mm. It, like it's some of these guys only, it's such an industry down there that it's, it's huge. And, and the vast majority of outfitters are doing it right. Mm -hmm. Some guys are doing it in pretty small pieces of property, like we talked about. It's not my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. But there's some places, for instance, my buddy in Namibia, where I hunt, he has his farm s separated to north and south across the highway. But his property, his fence line, I think is 13 kilometers by 17 kilometers. Like okay. We aren't talking... 40 acre plots. Right. It's big enough there. If you walked onto there and you didn't have water and, and you got lost, you'd yeah. be in serious trouble. Right. Yeah. Decent size. Yeah. It's like I said, I, I, I'm not a high fence guy, but the spirit of fair chase does come into play down there. So do you get to go hunting with other people from work? Yeah. I'm on the lion hunt in March. Um, okay. my boss come with me. Oh, nice. So. Nice. So. Full support for why you're not going to be at work. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So he's Excellent. looking for he's looking for a good male lion too. We'll see see what we can come across, right? Interesting. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, that works out. Love to hear the story on that. Um, yeah. What else? Anything else? I'm trying to think of the list we discussed. Oh, well, we got some stuff about uh, we got SCI yeah. uh, first safari. Um, the list. There you go. Um, yeah, you know, talk, you've talked about ballistics there a little bit and you're, you're, um, and that, and that's something that you, you're dealing with the general public mostly with your, uh, with Corth group there or. Yeah. Well, I generally deal with accounts directly, but the consumers who get hold of me sometimes and I, I steer them in the right, right direction and get them looked after if they have issues and try to educate people. But the biggest thing is like, we could do a whole, whole talk just on this is what people consider bullet failure mm. and you, you killed the animal, you it shot in the right place, it died, the bullet came apart. Well, okay. 
did it really fail? Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, when you go back to the Weatherby cartridges, Mm -hmm. which were developed long time ago. Mm-hmm. And they're still holding their edge, like velocity wise, and they're still right up in the top, even with today's standards. Mm-hmm. Roy Weatherby wanted that bullet to blow up. Okay. He believed in the hydrostatic shock theory. Goes in and comes apart, massive damage, mm-hmm. shock power. Right. And that's what he believed in way back then. And so guys are shooting the modern Weatherby cartridges, or the Weatherby cartridges, the 300 Weatherby, mm-hmm. and which came out in the 40s, I believe. Mm-hmm. And they're putting these controlled round, ex- controlled expansion bullets in them and having great success, but that's contrary to what Roy wanted. Mm. But there's, well, what I'm trying to say there, it's, there's two schools of thought and they both work. What are the biggest education pieces that you typically have to deal with and how do you guys tackle that? Are you educating consumers? Are you educating the, uh, uh, the retailers? We'll, we, we start with the retailers, yeah. but we will do... Like we've been at some, at some of the trade shows and hunting shows yeah. with our booth there and we're there to talk to people firsthand mm-hmm. and we'll have video displays sometimes depending on what they come and we'll have people from the factory come up. It's funny, it, you, you can have a guy who works at Hornady mm-hmm. in Nebraska come up and tell a person something and they'll, means a whole lot more coming from him than me. Sure. Even though that guy sits behind a desk. Sure. sure. But it, it's just because of. The credibility thing, right? Yeah. And so that always helps, but no, we'll, we'll get with the, with the dealer. Yeah. Try to educate them and we'll do events with them. I'll, what we call PK, product knowledge sessions. Mm. I'll go in usually right about the time they close and go over with employees and have a chat and go over stuff and they'll ask questions and we'll explain why we do this, why is this and how it competes with our competitors or, mm. and that kind of stuff, right? You know, there's never going to be an end to people modifying or doing things differently than what the manufacturer intended it to do. Yeah. Uh, having been through a number of the different manufacturers' courses and, and programs, it's always neat the things that you pick up that you thought were maybe, uh, that you didn't realize are actually designed features. Yeah. Because you didn't know the proper way to use it. Um, I, I can see the education piece being a very valuable both sales tool as well as uh uh, ensuring that people are getting the most out of whatever product they have. Yeah. I was shocked at how many people don't focus binoculars properly. Okay. Talk me through it. Well, you have your, your main focus. Yeah. Then you have your diopter, which adjusts the, the one eye. Yeah. And, um, so when you're looking through, you, you pick out, pick out an object, I don't, you get in a store. So I always say, yeah. pick up that stop sign across the street. Yeah. Put the lens cap on the right eye, focus your left eye. Yeah. With the main focus. Okay. Close that one, open the right, now adjust the diopter in the same thing. Mm. And uh, so you're focusing each eye individual. You have your diopter, you're focusing, and then your focus, your course focus are set up the same. Most people have both eyes open. Yeah. And they're focusing, oh, sorry. Yeah. Focusing, hitting that, or they squint with one eye. Yeah. But when you squint, your body changes. What if you, ch- what if you set the diopter first? Well, like- I, does it matter? Probably your way is better because then you know at least you've got a. I, 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 maybe the way I do it is backwards. You're supposed yeah. to do the diopter first, but as long as, as long as you're doing it both individually, okay, with the lens cap on the on the optic or it covered, so you're not squinting with both eyes open, ah, it's okay. going to give you the best performance. Awesome. Okay, so I always do diopter first and yep. the other side, but I might try the try doing. Yep. The, okay. I mean, and it's I was taught the guy who taught me sitting in, in a PK. Yeah. He said, this is how you do it. And you know, human nature, that's what I was told. So that's the right way. Doesn't mean it was. Well, if that's how the manufacturer designed it, you might as yeah. well try using it the intended way that it was Yeah, it was but you know, like as a rep, I get things wrong sometimes too, right? Sure. So he could have had it backwards too. And, and, but it, it makes a huge difference mm-hmm. on focusing it that way. No kidding. What about, uh, scopes? If you put too much, you know, a lot of PRS shooters will put their hand over top of the scope and the, when they're shooting, I've watched videos that, uh, MDT has put out about pressure testing on barrels. What if you press on the scope? Is that going to make a big difference? Maybe in laboratory conditions, but I can't see it in the field. Okay. Um, I know when you're resting your, resting your rifle on something, you want it in the forearm, not the barrel, mm-hmm. because that's going to affect harmonics. Yeah. And all these things, I know what drives me nuts when you see guys carrying the rifle by their scope, like a handle. Mm. It's not a handle. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's 
don't use it as such. Note to self, stop carrying rifle by scope. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, there's so much stuff out there that I still will find myself using incorrect terms, even though like I'll be talking to people and I start talking, I use the term gather light, like we spoke earlier. Sure, it's yeah. not, it, it, it's, it's transmit and it focus light and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But loopholes put a lot of stuff, money into training us. Mm. They have a range out down in central Oregon. I can't remember if it's 2,300 meters or 2,600 meters, but it, it's a ways. It's, it's well, decent. well past the mile. Yeah. And, uh, they have us lined up there with all our competitor scopes mm -hmm. and, and our line. Yep. And then you, you get there before sun up. And as soon as you can start, see, as soon as you can start, you can see, you can start shooting. Okay. And then the same thing in the evening when you shoot, shoot till you can't see. Right. And there's two optics that are consistently the first one shooting mm. and consistently the last two shooting. Interesting. And loopholes, one of them with their new light system, with the new lenses and they've put stuff and there's some, there, we've got some great competitors out there. Sure. And we've yeah. got some competitors that aren't so great. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing that makes our company is the people behind it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's still a family owned business, fifth generation, fifth mm -hmm. generation. And when, when we do these tests and when, and when they do the, the Punisher test, the, the impact test, mm. they don't go take a scope off the floor. They run down to the local sports shop and buy everything. Even the loophole product they buy off the shelf. Yeah. So it is a true test. Very cool. I was just thinking of, uh, you know, if there's education pieces, maybe we, uh, create little, uh, short education content that will get people out there using products properly and, uh, yeah. or maybe that's something that, uh, Korth is interested in doing. Yeah. We, we've talked about that and it's always, always intend to do it. And then the next thing you know, a year's passed, right? And yeah, yeah, shot again and yeah. everyone's ramping up for that yeah. and then doing. But it, it's funny, like in this industry, back to the A-type personalities, um, I was at a event with Rob Furlong. Yep. And he was talking to a guy about shooting. Okay. And about shooting down here uphill and how the range finder with the ballistic aiming system adjusted for it. Sure. And this guy looked at Rob. He goes, well, obviously you haven't shot very much. He goes, because the bullets defy your avid, nothing happens. And, <laughs> and Rob, Rob goes, yeah, I'm just new. I'm just learning. <laughs> and I, I always thought like, why didn't you put that person in his place? He goes, what's it going to change? Yeah, exactly. It, it, why? It, yeah. So here's a guy. And at this time, I, at this point, I think Rob was still number two in the world mm. for, for length. Yeah. Here's a guy talking to him, like doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Yeah. Talking down to him. And if he only knew, if he only knew who he was talking to, but you can't, it's, it's you, you can't help some people. You know, sometimes it doesn't rise to the dignity of a response. Yeah. Right. And, and it's no matter what you tell people, pe some people just, just want to complain want to find something to argue about. Yep. And, and they don't quite listen to what was said or they take it as a absolutely every scenario, this is how it works and it doesn't. There's too many variables in this stuff. Yeah. You know, I've spent some time with Rob in the past and, um, you know, good, good fellow, definitely knows what he's talking about when it comes to, uh, shooting. I remember I was at SHOT Show one time and I'm at the, um, uh, AI booth and there's a fellow there who's really looked like he was dyed black hair, really dark hair. It looked like you could smell it on him. He was giving her the night before tattoos up one arm down the other. He's just standing there in the AI booth and I'm looking at, I think there is some, uh, packs, maybe they're Everly, Everly sock, maybe I forget what it was. And, and he comes up, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm doing some, um, uh, pack design. Oh, okay. And fair enough. Right. And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, no, they, they wanted my input on this stuff. Oh, are you with these people here? Well, no, no, I'm not with them. Okay. Right. And we had this little convert, very awkward conversation. Basically he's like, don't you know who I am? <laughs> right. So the guy was Craig Harrison who took the, yeah, yeah. he Cor took Corporal the. Corporal Harrison. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, he was, he was looking rough maybe from the last night in Vegas, probably going out with all the other, uh, industry reps and, yeah. and, and taking them out. But I had no clue. I've seen pictures of him. Yeah. Like he's fully. Yeah, he had he, shirts on, his beret and everything else. And he looked to, uh, this guy was like, like, okay. So, and he's talking about the rifles a little bit and like, oh, so you, you're, you're in the manufacturing of these? Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. And, and he skated all around the issue. Yeah. If he said, Hey, I'm Craig Harrison, I would have known who he was, but yeah. we just had this 
probably about a 10 minute long, very awkward conversation where he left like, oh, that guy's. <laughs> so probably maybe similar to the whole Rob, Her- Rob Furlong one. Yeah. Well, it's one of the things that's like most things when the people, people have to tell you what they've done, they probably haven't done it. Yeah. Or maybe they're just, you know, surrounding themselves with the wrong type of people. I clearly didn't recognize yeah. them out of uniform and all the rest and not diminishing what he's done or his achievements. And, you know, he's had a rough go as well yep. afterwards. There's some pretty difficult things that he had to, to uh, work through and that's, yep. um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's better just to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. And that well, I guess it's like sometimes like when I'm in a situation, someone's talking, I'll sit there and think, should I interject? And then I don't, hmm. and I regret doing it. But then when I do, it's like, I shouldn't know. But then you really regret yeah, it, right? It's like, so it's keeping your mouth shut. Like you say, just, mm-hmm. it goes a long way sometimes. So I like to sit and listen and, um, hear people talk and social media is a thing. I watch these chat rooms and stuff and people discussing stuff. And it's like, yeah, no, you don't know what you're talking about. But, yeah. but it's, you get in there and try correcting it. It just, it goes nowhere mm-hmm. and it just digresses and just raises your blood pressure. Nothing else seems to happen, right? <laughs> It's all about finding the right group of people that you're going to surround yourself with who will value your time. You don't have to get into the, the convincing. Yeah. You know, I, I guess it's difficult when you're really passionate about something and you see things, the consequence of not stepping in and saying something would just be the continuance of that ignorance or at least yep. less openness to that way of thinking. But generally speaking, no matter how well versed you are in this, you learn something every day. Mm-hmm. If you, even, All the time. Even from people who don't know a fraction of what you know, yeah. but they might know something that you don't mm-hmm. and you listen to them and it can go a long ways. Mm-hmm. There's always something you can pick out. And yeah. even if you think it's a little offside, go give it a shot See, or do your own research and yeah. find it out before uh, yeah. jumping on the person. Nice. Well, why don't we take a look at wrapping it up here. We okay. can, we can, um, uh, look at few there, f- future educational type things. Absolutely. As we work through, because I think that's, I think that's a really important part. I mean, we're not going to convince people listening to this that African hunting is great or terrible. We're not going to convince people of, uh, different politics if they're already set in a certain way, but Hey, maybe some people are going to be able to use their, their, uh, binoculars a bit better moving forward. Right. Or understand the high twist rate on their, um, yeah. ELDX bullets and what's happening there. You know, I mean, as long as people listen to each other and, and, and we start working together as that's, I mean, that gets beat like a dead horse, but it's, we still have the same issues, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think that just comes down to what you're saying before. Maybe keep our mouth shut a little bit, take a listen, see where it's at and we find the correct way or the correct audience yeah. that we. I mean, everybody has their passion. Yeah. And like living in the States for as long as I did, a lot of people like sitting in a tree stand with a bull waiting for a deer to walk by. Mm. I can't think of a bigger waste of time personally, <laughs> but I will fight for their right to do that. Right? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's what they have, it's what they do and. And they love it. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some people get the sheep bug. Yep. I, I've shot sheep, but I never got the sheep bug. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's. There's uh, nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, everybody has their own passions and you got to follow those. A whole different world. And yeah. is looking down at the other ones who are doing the exact same thing as you, just in a different way. Yeah. Is not helping anybody. No. Well, Matt, thank you so much for being Thanks on the Thanks for podcast. having me. Really enjoyed this. Thank you.